Um, so my name is Michael Fleming, and I'm here to talk to you guys about why I love my job and all the things I'm learning along the way. Uh, a lot of people, unless you are in the nonprofit development community, probably don't know what St. Clair Superior is. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is set up to look after this part of Cleveland, which roughly runs from the inner belt all the way to MLK and north to the lake. Um, it has a great location, honestly, on the lake, although you wouldn't know it by talking to the people there. Uh, really well situated next to downtown and University Circle. Most people call it Midtown, which is a marketing failure on my part. Um, what you do know, if, any, if you are familiar with our work, it would be something like this, the dragon sculptures, which you'll see every summer. Uh, it's going to be the Chinese zodiac that we do, and this year is the year of the snake. You'll see these populate all over the neighborhood. It's really, really cool. Uh, here's a couple different examples. Um, another, I know these are cool. Another problem, though, is that I keep hearing people calling them the Midtown Dragons. And so, it's just people don't really know what St. Clair, Clair Superior is. So. Hopefully I can clear that up to you. Uh, St. Clair Superior has been called the next neighborhood for a long time now, and it's really started since when Ohio City and Tremont started picking up. Uh, people were looking at this neighborhood so close to downtown with so many amenities, why wouldn't that one also uh, lift up? And truthfully, it has incredible diversity. We have over 23 languages or dialects spoken in our Asian community alone. Uh, we have uh, Croatians, Serbians, Slovenians, uh, African Americans, and there's even an Ethiopian pocket. Uh, but it's not just culturally diverse, it is also very diverse with the businesses. We've got 10,000 businesses with, I'm sorry, 1,000 businesses with 10,000 employees uh, during the daytime that populate, you know, factories and warehouses, uh, but also high-tech office, such as this at Tyler Village. And, um, Furthermore, we are responsible for Asiatown, which was one of the only growing communities in uh, Cuyahoga last year, um, one with actual rising population. And Asiatown, we branded this about six years ago, and that branding effort has really allowed for people to identify with it, um, meaning that they can put it at, point to it on a map, and they also can uh, enjoy events like this, which is the Asian Festival. It started four years ago, it now has uh, expected over 50,000 people to show up this year in May. Um, but what's interesting about it, too, is that it allows for a clustering effect. So we did have some Asian businesses before, but now we have groups of Asian businesses, like there are four uh, Vietnamese noodle houses all right next to one another. <laughs> and, okay, and just to cut you guys off, I know there's going to be one or two people in the audience that want to remind me that pho and ro don't rhyme with one another, but that's marketing. I mean, you just can't. We manage the Quarter Arts District also, which is uh, a group of you know, scores of artists uh, and galleries that are located in and around the Asiatown area and sort of populating all of those old warehouse buildings. And you'll see some of these, like uh, Zygote Press is a great one. Uh, the Morgan Conservatory of Paper Making is amazing. Um, and, but what we've been really known for of late is the urban grazing program. Um, this was really interesting. This started off with just needing to get some land taken care of. There's a lot of vacant land, as people uh, before me have talked about, like Mansfield Fraser, and th the city doesn't have enough money to take care of all of it, you know? So we said, well, this is kind of hampering people's opinions of the neighborhood and development around it, so what can we do? And we got 21 sheep and a llama to actually graze the land, uh, which this is at 55th and North Marginal. Um, wonderful project. And uh, this is, here, here's the llama. Uh, <laughs> so the, the neighbors called her Buttercup, and then the, all, the, all the sheep were the princesses. <laughs> and this is actually interesting. This is taken right after the air show, and, and you can tell because they're grazing in formation. But we got, needless to say, a lot of press about this. Not just locally, we also got uh, national press from all the way from you know, Santa Cruz, California, Portland, Oregon, people really interested in this really simple concept. Um, I think the high point for me was when I got called an idiot on radio by this guy. <laughs> I mean, for the Clevelanders in the room, you sort of know you've arrived, am I right? Okay, and the other thing is I challenge anybody here to come up with a play on words about sheep that I haven't already heard. <laughs> Headline writers eat this stuff up. 
But, okay, so the, what we really learned from doing this, though, is that this little project changed a lot of attitudes. Um, we had people coming from all over to check out the sheep. We had tour buses. Lolly the trolley would come by with people. Um, and the best was we even had somebody, one of the residents of Key 55, the building in the front, said that she thought she got a really great deal when she had a Lakeview apartment, and now she wished she had a Sheep View apartment. <laughs> so the lesson is to really get people to like where they live. And Clevelanders, by our nature, are a self-deprecating lot. And that's not a quote from me. That's actually from the New York Times travel section in 2005. And I think that we've gotten a little bit better since 2005, but it is still something that we need to work on, is changing those attitudes. And when you're doing major downtown building, for example, that works really well, but it doesn't give people a way to interact with their city. And, and things like this really do. Um, here's another project that we started. We were looking on St. Clair, and we saw about six or, or eight stores just like this that were selling goods right out on the street, including, you know, um, anything from mattresses to used clothing to diapers to, maybe it wasn't diapers, but there was a few other things. We looked at all of those and we saw, this is kind of cool, it's almost like a flea market. And every great city I've ever been to has a great flea market. Um, Cleveland's flea market is in Berea. <laughs> so we partnered with uh, the Indy Foundry to come up with the Cleveland flea. And this is a way to just build on the assets that are already going on in the neighborhood um, and we have, it, we have well over 50 vendors coming in once a month now to uh, sell items like vintage clothing, um, handmade goods, architectural salvage, and you can even take classes like this terrarium making class, which doesn't that sound pretty cool? Like, I know you would make that for somebody. <laughs> so this, again, is uh, the second Saturday uh, of the month. Look for it next month. It's going to be amazing. Um, about 67th, 62nd in St. Clair. Uh, and follow us. Um, so again, the lesson right there was building on the assets that are already there. And we have an incredible asset in our neighborhood in the Slovenian community. As any Slovenian will tell you, there are more Slovenians in Cleveland than there are in any other city in the world outside of Slovenia. And they're right over there. So we created, because the, the group felt like, you know, the city wasn't giving them any love and their neighborhood was going downhill. So we wanted to sort of reunite everybody around that community and we created Kurantavanje Cleveland, which is actually, Kurantavanje is actually a celebration, a uh, pre-Lenten celebration that happens in Slovenia. It's the most popular celebration all year. And um, it's based on this thing, which is called the current. The current is a Slavic uh, pagan-based, uh, beast, basically, um, a god that was supposed to stomp out winter and welcome spring. And you can see that he has these bells around his waist, and he's got this bat that beats away evil spirits. Um, so I was honored <laughs> by the Slovenian community to be allowed to wear this outfit and go on, on uh, Fox 8 News in the morning. Um, and it, it was really great. It, it's hot in there, though, because it's about 40 pounds of, like, sheepskin. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, and it's totally unrelated, okay? <laughs> I was also honored when they let me lead the parade. So that's me going down the street. Um, and uh, so the parade and the, and the carnival included all these currents. Again, the, uh, there's a princess, there's a devil, um, there's dancing in the streets, polka music, uh, something called a shot ski, which you guys should probably try. Um, <laughs> More fuzzy currents, uh, more dancing, more shot skis. <laughs> and there was even great things for kids to do, like these crafting and, and face painting. Um, and the kids had a good time. But, well, the ones that liked the current had a good time. The ones that were a little bit afraid of the current, <laughs> they would just stand back. They don't even want to do anything with it. But little known fact, uh, Maurice Sendak, actually, this is one of the inspirations for his Where the Wild Things Are. So, think of our community when you think of that. Um, so at the end of it all, I was really, again, honored and touched when the Slovenians came to me and said, it was so neat that this American group can bring us all together and, and do it with something that's our own festival, you know, and actually teach us how to do that. But being a fickle group, they also reminded me that I was wearing the bells on the wrong side.
So the next lesson that we learned, and I think you heard this lesson earlier too through Mansfield Fraser, is that vacancy is a very tremendous opportunity. We talk about it like a negative in our city, but it, if you look at it um, like an opportunity, you'll really start to see things differently. And here's an example. This map scared the hell out of me when I first started at work. And all of these little uh, parcels have everything with a little line around it, everything with a color that represents some sort of vacancy or um, it's in foreclosure on some level, or it's uh, possibly in arrears and taxes of over $1,000. And so you can see how lit up that map is. It's pretty terrifying. Um, but I was reminded by a developer that the best thing to ever happen to Chicago was Mrs. O'Leary's cow, right? And while I'm sure they agreed with that statement in Chicago at the time, we really took it to heart and uh, we decided to do the Loft Home Project, which is a partnership with uh, the Cuyahoga County Land Bank. So in the Loft Home, we're actually taking homes like this one at East 71st and Schaefer, where you can see that it's boarded up, it's got broken out windows, um, it even had some fire damage to it, and we went inside, take out a whole portion of the second floor, turning a, uh, a two-family house into a single family, uh, making it more amenable to how we live today. Um, and we were able to reuse all the materials to rebuild stuff like, uh, like that island right there on the inside. And we also were able to keep details, making it sort of rustic feeling by, by keeping the exposed brick and by keeping the, uh, um, the beams exposed like this. And this really, really awesome property, uh, we were able to accomplish for $11,500. And that's including the purchase, including the fees. And what's really significant about this is that when the land bank goes to demolish a home, it costs them eight to ten thousand dollars. So we figured out with the land bank that they could actually finance these homes. And so they put in the money, the home stays, doesn't get torn down, and they get their money back at the end. And so it just it was a, a winning project. And so we already have these, there we're working on four right now, two others are already completed, and there's a waiting list to occupy them. If you work in urban development or urban planning uh, and design, you will hear a lot about vibrancy. Um, this is from Vibrant Streets, which is a conference I'm gonna be speaking at later on next month. They created a toolkit for how do you create vibrancy in a neighborhood. And you can see all the tools here. They include security and anchors and guidance from organizations like mine. Um, we are doing the same thing, taking notes from their playbook to create Retail Ready. Um, this has been sponsored by Charter One Growing Communities. And Retail Ready, we, when, we, when we looked at St. Clair Avenue, we saw a lot of great buildings. Um, and all of these great buildings had a lot of vacancy on the first floor. Again, that problem of vacancy. We thought, okay, if we move one business over there, um, they're gonna be what in real estate terms they call a pioneer. And they call it a pioneer because the pioneer gets the arrows in the back. So instead of moving just one, we thought, okay, well, what if we move five or 10 businesses all at the same time? And that's where the Retail Ready concept came from. Um, we ch challenged uh, people to start to take over spaces like these, and we ended up getting a series of businesses, including this dance studio, a coffee shop, a uh, bakery, um, there is an expansion on a museum, um, and there was a handful of other ones that we're still working with, but we're getting them all in there at the same time so that they're creating their own sort of networked neighborhood, and it's a relatively instant change. Um, and talk about vibrancy, these, the dance studio has kids literally dancing in the windows on the street. <laughs> uh, it also includes a lot of public art, a uh, really important element. This one is called Hope Sketch, funded by the Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. And this is getting people's uh, take on the neighborhood and their hopes and dreams for it. And this project that will sort of be temporary public art, as you see there, that's gonna be then distilled into a final art project of scale and scope that's gonna really change the vision of the neighborhood. And we took this as, we don't know what it's gonna look like yet because we have to get that public input, but it's on this scale, which is what I took from Chicago. It's gonna be something like that to really just change people's minds about the neighborhood. Um, and we're also looking at Slovenian uh, historic colors and patterns and folk art 
um, to create new patterns for the neighborhood that will help brand it and also help with uh, artistic board up projects. But what we realized in this process is that we didn't have a hook. Like we have some great businesses that are great for the neighborhood, but there wasn't something that I was gonna get you guys to drive all the way across town to go over there. So you might, you have your own bakery, your own coffee house in your own neighborhood. It just doesn't make sense to go all the way to mine. So we started looking at uh, upcycling, which is a very, very strong art form here in Cleveland, because in the Rust Belt we all have shrinking cities, which means we have a lot of excess stuff. And upcyclists take refuse, essentially, and they create value out of it. And so we created this project uh, uh, based on the artists that we have, not only in our neighborhood, but in Greater Cleveland. Um, there's a network of over 50 that we have right now that are creating jewelry, um, purses like that one. Uh, I think that's awesome. This is really cool, it's the uh, uh, vinyl cut into the shape of Ohio. Um, but it's on a scale too, so they also work on uh, tearing down houses like a piece of Cleveland and turning that into furniture. Um, but the problem is they are all working out of these sort of hidden recessed spaces back in galleries and in deep inside buildings. They don't have any retail space for them. So Urban Upcycle, this is incidentally how it works. It all makes sense, so, so don't worry. <laughs> A little insight into my mind, I guess. So uh, we are working with Nicole McGee from Collective Upcycle to populate vacant storefronts on St. Clair with collectives of upcycling artists. And we are also offering uh, a creative reuse center where um, all of these materials can be found, where people will just donate stuff from a warehouse or from a factory, and then upcycling artists will come in, um, or teachers or students can come in and pick out stuff to make their own uh, art. And, excuse me, uh, we're creating a community designed uh, park right in the center of the whole thing, and that's gonna house the flea market and other events that we'll do around upcycling. And we have a very, very creative way of marketing the whole thing where we'll take storefronts in other parts of the county and populate it with uh, our upcyclist art and a way to purchase just through the window using your phone and QR codes. Um, there's also going to be a community design lab where the, the community can help us uh, redesign our neighborhood, can also take classes in upcycling like the one that uh, we're doing at the Flea. And uh, we also have a great idea for doing uh, an event called uh, Iron Upcycler where <laughs> you'll, you'll be given, the our three artists will be given a raw material and they have to, you know, figure out what to do with that by the end of it to really create value. So, so anyway, that's, it, that's like taking a drink from a fire hose, so I apologize. We're working on a lot of projects. Um, but I wanted to show you two more images that I think are really impactful. This one is obviously on February 9th of this year at 3 p.m. Um, and this, after our interventions, is two weeks later at the exact same time. And it's just people out on the street enjoying uh, what our neighborhood has to offer. And I think that's super exciting. Thank you.